Welcome to episode 33 of The Cancer Pod. The truth about antioxidants is fascinating, and it can also be confusing. In this episode, we tell you what an antioxidant is and discuss a couple of popular supplements. So stick around as Leigh and I talk about the pros, the cons, and some contraindications of antioxidants during and after cancer treatment. I'm Dr. Tina Kayser, and as Leah likes to say, I'm the sciencey one. And I'm Dr. Leah Sherman, and I'm the Cancer Insider. And we're two naturopathic doctors who practice integrative cancer care. But we're not your doctors. This is for education, entertainment, and informational purposes only. Do not apply any of this information without first speaking to your doctor. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast by the hosts and their guests are solely their own. Welcome to the Cancer Pod. Hey, Tina. Hi, Leah. What are we talking about today? We're going to talk about a pretty big topic, and we're going to try to do it concisely, and it's antioxidants. Oh, that's a good one. A lot of people have a lot of questions about antioxidants. Yes. And yeah, it'd be nice to, as part of our The Truth About series, is just kind of cover this really in-depth topic in less than an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you know, the thing about all of these topics that we chose, the truth about, is they tend not to be black and white answers. They tend to be gray. And that makes it less than convenient because you can't just go like, oh, yes, boom, 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 go this direction or no, don't do that. It's more like depends on the antioxidant we're talking about. So, Right. And then with cancer people, it depends on the treatment that they're getting. I mean, there's just so many factors that play into it. But we're we're going to try to just give a little bit more information. This isn't really like a specific supplement episode, but we are going to talk about not only what are antioxidants, you know, what do they do, but we're also going to kind of give a couple of examples of a couple of products that patients come to us with because they are touted as being these antioxidant supplements. Yeah, I think anyone listening is going to find that there is party lines out there. There's the don't do antioxidants and there's the, my God, you can't get enough antioxidants kind of people and neither of them are correct in my view. Yeah. So we're going to cover all that. And at the end, we're going to try something a little different. We're going to read a couple of re reviews that we've gotten on Apple Podcasts because there's some really nice ones and we'll share them. Sounds like a good idea. Great. Because we're really bad at... Um, at tooting our own horn. So other people have tooted our horns and so we're going to... We're going to play those horns. We're going to use their words. That's right. To tell y'all how awesome we are. Um, <laughs> so, so Tina, okay. So, yeah. so antioxidant, what does that mean? Yeah. So I suppose the only way to define antioxidant is to define what an oxidant is in the first place. And then we can talk about the fact that we're having the opposite effect with antioxidants. <laughs> So an oxidant or oxidation, the process of oxidation has to do with damage to cell membranes using electrons. Ah, okay. Back up. Let me put this in real. <laughs> so sciencey. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So let's not go down into the chemistry of this. Let's just think about this in a real world situation. We know what rust is, right? You've seen rust, whether it's on iron pans or on a car, rust happens that is the oxidation of iron that you're seeing. So an iron pan is black and it's lovely and it's not oxidized. You put water on it, leave it out, whatever, abuse it a little bit. It reacts and has rust formation. That is iron oxidation right there that you're looking at. So for us in our bodies, it's no different. Oxidation is a chemical reaction that can result in damage to cellular membranes, cellular components. A lot of times it's the fats in and around cells that get damaged. But oxidation happens as a reaction. It's a chemical reaction that causes damage to cells. That's really all you need to know. So this oxidative damage or oxidative stress, as it's known, um, is caused by things in our environment, right? So whether it's things that we ingest or things we're exposed to, like pollution or cigarette smoke. That is exogenous 
oxidation, but most of the oxidation is happening due to our process of making energy within cells. That itself is an oxidative process. Okay. And so those are known as free radicals. Yes. But I want to be clear because when we talk about oxidation, it's not always bad. Without oxidation, you and I wouldn't be standing here talking either. Oxidation is the product of the combustion of fuel in our cells. So when a cell chews up glucose and makes energy from that glucose or it chews up a fatty acid and makes energy from that fatty acid, in the process of doing that, it's an oxidative process. I'm saying that because inherent to living is oxidation. So we can't live without it. Okay. So, so these free radicals are formed daily. They're not necessarily a bad thing. They're not necessarily inherently bad, no, because they're necessary for life. And a free radical is an oxidative molecule. It's a molecule that has this wayward electron. That's why we call it a free radical. Yeah, I think people hear that a lot, especially in certain products that are marketed. They use you know, the word free radical. They use the word oxidative stress. Um, so these are things that happen all the time. They aren't necessarily bad. But when they are bad and they cause cell damage, that can lead to other issues. Right. So when things are going well, the amount of oxidation in our cells is balanced with our antioxidant mechanisms, so whether that's directly nutrients like vitamin C and vitamin E, or it's intracellular inside the cell enzymes that are actually turned on due to the oxidation. So our bodies are amazing that way. So if we make oxidation within a cell, our cell then goes, oh, there's some oxidation. We have to create more antioxidant enzymes like glutathione and negate it. And so it actually always is going back and forth like a teeter-totter, right? Oxidation, antioxidation. And that flow, that dynamic flow is what keeps us healthy. Okay. I think that's a pretty good explanation. So if our body makes these antioxidants like glutathione, then... Why do we need to get them from the outside? Why do we need to get external antioxidants? There's two different antioxidant systems. One is those enzymes. Glutathione is the one that people might be most aware of, but there's other ones. There's superoxide dismutase and others. That is a system of antioxidants that are strong. They're very potent. Think of the enzymes as the most potent antioxidants we have in our bodies we don't ingest those. We produce them in response to oxidation. And then on the lighter side, we have actual nutrients, vitamin C, vitamin E are the ones most people know about, that will take that extra electron and they'll squelch the free radical on their own. So when you say vitamin C and vitamin E, I'm going to kind of speak for you. You're talking about foods. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's that's the big thing. So do we want antioxidants as foods? Yeah, we'll, we'll take a little break and then we'll come back and we're going to talk about the difference between antioxidant foods and antioxidant supplements, which, you know, it, it's the supplements that may be more of a concern when it comes to cancer and cancer treatments. Definitely. So we'll be back. If you're not sure which foods are richest in antioxidants, look for the rainbow. The pigments are what have antioxidant effects. For example, carotenoids are yellow to red and anthocyanins are in the blue to red spectrum. All right, we're back. One of the most common questions that I hear from patients, you know, are questions about taking antioxidants during treatment. I think that, you know, it's such a catchphrase in the cancer world mm -hmm. that, you know, people hear antioxidants help to reduce your risk of cancer and help with reducing the risk of getting other diseases. And I think the big thing that's left out is that the studies that show the benefit show the benefit when it's foods. I don't know if there actually have been studies that have definitively shown that supplements are better than food when it comes to antioxidants and, and reducing the risk of chronic diseases? I would say no. The majority of the research is on food and foods are so complex. So yeah, even, you know, even something as simple as lutein that people think for their eyes, you know, and even Bosch and Lom, the large company has that AREDS product that's mm -hmm. very popular out there. And there is a study on AREDS, don't get me wrong. But all the information on lutein, if you look it up, is really not on a supplement so much. It's mostly they found that when people ate greens specifically, because 
Unbeknownst to them, they were eating a lot of lutein when they ate collards or kale or any kind of leafy greens. So you can't see the yellow. Lutein is yellow because it's hidden behind the chlorophyll. But anyways, those are very high in it. And, and, the, and you're right. Almost all of them for cancer care, it's a similar thing where they looked at ingestion of high plant-based diets. And that seems to be risk reduction. I, I have a, I don't know if I've mentioned this before on previous episodes, but I have a little lutein, um, not a lutein story, but egg yolks mm-hmm. contain a really high amount of lutein. And I see a lot of people, especially elderly people who don't eat egg yolks out of fear of cholesterol. And so I always think of that. I think of people because macular degeneration is something that is, you know, it, it's the onset is later in life. Mm-hmm. And so I think of people eating their little egg white omelets or egg white scrambles, and they're missing out on that lutein. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, it goes back to color, right? I mean, you can't go wrong with colors from nature. Almost everything we're talking about, you can't go wrong with a colorful plate. And that means if you're having eggs or you're having hash browns next to it, use some purple potatoes. I mean, you can really just up your color ante all the time and make sure when you look down at your plate, it's not monotone white or monotone off-white. Yeah. And there's a bit of a backlash that I've seen about people, you know, not not liking when, you know, people like you and me are like, eat the rainbow. And they're like, well, there are certain foods that are traditional foods that, you know, maybe they are brown. And I think that's great. Eat those foods that are traditional foods that might be on the brown and beige scale, but add in some rainbow colors too. Like you said, you know, try it with a purple potato or maybe instead of using like a a green cabbage, use a purple cabbage. I mean, it might have a different flavor profile, but you're getting a little bit more of that color. So there are ways to continue eating, you know, in the comfort foods that we love. You know, one of my favorite recipes for mac and cheese is to throw in a can of pumpkin or butternut squash into that mix. So it's still the comfort food and it's just got a little extra. Oomph. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you're making meatloaf, you can put shredded carrot into your meatloaf. So I think that it's really an important concept because you don't need to know much. There's no science that you need to understand for that. You'll still get the net benefit. So in, in summary, food first. Always. <laughs> You know, because, you know what, we still can't do it. Like, I always say this, like, you know, we don't have all of the answers. We'd like to think we do, you know. And and I think, honestly, I think that back in the 40s and the 50s, when somehow the dominant paradigm in medicine became better living through chemistry, we thought we could do everything in a pill, right? That still resonates. People still are looking for pills in place of food and in place of exercise and in place of good sleep, you know. So that's why we still have so many weight loss gimmicks out there. It's like, no, you're not going to get it in a pill. It's just not going to happen. It's not a very fun truth, but that is the truth. There's no fast track. I think that's a really good lead in for one of the products that we were going to talk about. It initially was touted as being this sort of replacement for, oh, you don't like fruits and vegetables? Well, you should have this product instead. And that's Juice Plus. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that product... It it kind of has its its popularity waves. It comes and goes. It is a multi level marketing product, and I mean, it got they got in trouble. They got in trouble for their their advertising claims. But it used to be advertised as being this like kind of whole fruits and vegetables product. All you need to do is take two of each one of these types of pills. There's a vegetable. There's a fruit blend, and then there is a berry blend, and you don't really need to eat fruits and vegetables. And to people who don't, who, who, you know, have never really acquired a taste for fruits and vegetables, it just seemed like this is awesome. All I have to do is take six pills a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, honestly, the appeal of that, of taking six pills a day, there's really no appeal in, in my mind, but I guess it's easier. It's easier than trying to figure out the fruits and vegetables that that you might enjoy or finding ways of preparing them so that you do enjoy them. Yeah. And this might be a good time to mention that your, your palate is trainable, right? I mean, finding a way to, to like fruits and vegetables is one, it's easier when you eat them in season because that's when they have the most flavor eating things out of season or sometimes just when they're shipped in from a long way away. I mean, I go to Trader Joe's just like anyone else, but I can tell you that that's very different than my local market. Right. And so the romaine lettuce at the local Saturday market tastes better to me than what I get at Trader Joe's. 
And it just has to do with flavor profiles. Of- right. Or the apples. Yeah. Apples in fall from up the road. Right. As opposed to like one that is not an apple season and it's just been in a warehouse and it's mealy. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, quality counts is when you're eating it naturally. And, and second of all, if you do things that are extremely salty or extremely sweet, and that's generally processed food, right? So if you're eating fast food or you're drinking soda pop or whatever, your palate then thinks that that is sweet. So when you go to bite into an apple, it has less of a sweet profile because it's only relative to what you've been eating for the last you know, couple months or so. So just kind of in the grand scheme, the less you eat processed food, the better natural food tastes over time. And I think, you know, going back to our our first movie reviews, growing your own food also can help. So whether you have a garden in your backyard or some pots of plants on your windowsill indoors, just that that process of growing your own food or herbs, I think also can can help with expanding that that palate. Yeah. And yeah. And so back to the juice plus thing that started us on this little tangent that I took us oh, on. Oh, yeah, I know, because I, I, we're going to end up talking about food, and it's like, wait, we're talking about <laughs> antioxidants here. Okay, so 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 Juice Plus. Now it's being marketed as sort of that bridge, that bridge between like what you eat and like what your body needs. Mm-hmm. There was a controversy years ago that when analyzed, it was found to contain actual synthetic-type vitamins in it that enhanced its quote, antioxidant profile. Ah, okay. That's now listed on the label. I couldn't find the information about how those were added in. Mm-hmm. But when I looked through, the, I think I, I kind of showed you where the labels were. It did have the mixed tocopherols. It had beta carotene. So it did have added, you know, added nutrients. Right. So it's not just whole food, you're saying. It's not. No. And it, and it, I mean, they, they've got the words plant-based on the website and I'm sure they've got like whole food. I mean, they just really try to like make it seem like this is the perfect substitute for fruits and vegetables. The really interesting thing is when you look at the ingredient list, all of the supplements have less than one gram of fiber hmm. in the capsules. And so I'm not sure how this product can be touted as, you know, a fruit and vegetable bridge when it doesn't even have the fiber Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. all of those other nutrients that have been shown to be beneficial. Yeah, that's an interesting point because the fiber obviously is needed. We recommend, what, 25 to 30 grams a day at least. Um, And that can only be gotten through whole foods, like actually eating the whole beans, whole vegetables, whole fruits, whatever. So yeah, I didn't realize Juice Plus had no fiber in it. Do they do they offer a fiber substitute to round that out for people or no? I didn't I didn't see anything on their website. I mean, now they're going to be like, oh, well, maybe we should have our our, our fiber pills too. <laughs> and it's it ends up being like Star Trek, right? Or or one of those like space age. Maybe it's with the Jetsons where you just kind of like push a button and then your pill comes out and that's your meal for the day. That was the Jetsons, yeah. The Jetsons versus Star Trek. You know, it's all it's all in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's here's the thing. Like anything that we use as a supplement, it's relative to the state of the person taking it in the first place. So I know Juice Plus puts a lot of clinical research on their website. Um, I know it's, it's dropped off of late, the last five years, not much, but back in the early 2000s, especially, they had quite a bit going on on there. Whether you see a change in someone's antioxidant status in their blood depends where they started from. So you and I eat a lot of vegetables. Let's just get that out there because that's what we do. If we take Juice Plus, there's probably not a measurable benefit in our bloodstream. But if you take someone who doesn't eat any, they just don't get a lot of color in their diet and they take Juice Plus, it might be a measurable jump in levels of nutrients because they're not getting a nutrient-dense diet in the first place. That's my guess. My guess is this is highly dependent on the state of the person before they started taking it, whether you see any difference at all. And and I tried looking at different, you know, random studies that were on the website. And I didn't find a lot of full articles if I found any at all, but I did, I think I did find a couple, but it seemed to be like the Juice Plus product versus placebo. Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything that was like Juice Plus versus an over-the-counter multivitamin versus placebo. Oh, So I wonder what the difference is between someone taking just your generic over-the-counter multivitamin versus Juice Plus versus 
a placebo? Like, would it be the same effect? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Because I would think that the polyphenols in the Juice Plus have a very different effect than the isolated nutrients in a multivitamin. So we should, then maybe I'll take this moment to say this. Those polyphenols is a fancy word for all the color that you're seeing. So when you hear polyphenol, it's an umbrella term for all of those other big words that we throw around, like anthocyanins or bioflavonoids. There's all of these different categories under polyphenols, and they tend to be the colorful pigments and the parts of the plants that we're using as antioxidants. And the way they work is they, for the most part, go into our cells and they tell the DNA, and I'm putting that in air quote tell, tell the DNA to make more glutathione, to make more superoxide dismutase, to make these antioxidant enzymes that are super powerful. So when we eat the color from nature, what we're doing is we're taking in some of it is antioxidant directly. So it'll float in our bloodstream and act as an antioxidant on its own. And some of it goes and directs our DNA to upregulate antioxidants within the cells themselves. And what I think is fascinating is glutathione goes up For example, it goes up everywhere in the cell, within the mitochondria, within the nucleus, within the cytosol. I mean, it's kind of a pretty neat system of balance. And so, yeah, it is true. The more oxidative stress you have, that means pollution, chemicals, treatment. Of course, treatment is oxidative. But do we really want to undo that? We're going to talk about Um, all of those things are oxidative stressors and antioxidants found in colorful fruits and vegetables are the most powerful antioxidants we have. So I just wanted, I wanted to put that out there because I think of them very differently than if you take a vitamin C tablet or a vitamin E. But there are other whole food multivitamins that are out there, like Garden of Life. They're big on that sort of like whole food combos for their vitamins. I'm definitely a fan of the whole food idea, but I think it should be literal. I think that we need to find ways of making the food palatable. Another way of maybe introducing yourself to that, if it's not something you do, is you find a cuisine that you like. So do you like Thai food? Do you like Vietnamese food? Do you like Italian food? Do you like Greek food? Find a cuisine that you actually enjoy already at a restaurant and start to become versed in how to make that particular food. Because a lot of people's traditional diets tend to be very high in fruits and vegetables, things you got from the garden. You know, So traditional diets were happening pre-refrigeration pre-packaging, pre-processed food. So if you find some cuisines that you actually enjoy, you can go that route. I mean, ideally it would be your own heritage that you would use, but heck, if you like Indian food, so be it. Learn how to make Indian food better or eat that more often. Yeah. And I just think of, you know, like the meat and potato patients, you know, they don't, they don't want to deviate beyond 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 that sort of sort of diet and so i mean it does take a little bit more work especially if people are working jobs and raising children and you know they have all of these these obstacles you know that's that's where i think the appeal of these pills come in for people who are just like look i i like my my meat and potatoes and i'm going to try this pill to get my vegetables because i don't want to be bothered cooking them i mean i I'm sure I've told the okra story, but when I was <laughs> when I was little, I lived down south, and the school cafeteria offered okra, and I didn't know what okra was. I didn't know it was a vegetable. I just knew it was this big, slimy pile on my tray, and it was gross, you know. And fast forward many years of not eating okra, I tried pickled okra, and it was delicious and crisp. And I mean, you could pickle anything, and I'll probably eat it, but you know, a lot of it is our past experience on how we eat something or how we try something. You know, it's the whole Brussels sprout thing, right? People eat boiled Brussels sprouts and they're just like, Brussels sprouts are disgusting. But then maybe if you have them prepared a different way, a person might actually like them. I have bought um, green beans frozen and I have this fondness just because it's how I grew up of um, those blocks of frozen spinach. You lost me there. You know, it's just, it's, no, I'm just saying, but that's, I just, I prefaced it by that's how I grew up, right? My yeah, mom would yeah. would do yeah. that and just put some butter on it, whatever. You put butter on anything, you know, makes it better. Um, but yeah, like there are, 
Stop it. Well, no. I, I, for One caveat is I don't like spinach cooked anyways, no matter how it comes. So I'm not a cooked spinach okay. fan. So we'll just, you know, maybe it's perfectly fine. I'll just... I, and maybe people don't like it, but it, it it's something that I grew up with that I actually enjoy. Um, but now that sounds horrible. My mom was a really good cook, but I don't know why we <laughs> used to get the blocks of spinach <laughs> from the commissary, whatever. Anyways, yeah, there are certain things that I do like frozen. Mm -hmm. Even Mm -hmm. the succotash or whatever, you know, you've got the carrots and the peas and the corn. Like I keep that in my freezer too. Sure. Throw that into things. Yes. So, so basically don't give up. Like if you don't like it one way, maybe you could try it another way, you know, and that's why I said in season as fresh as you can get it, it's probably going to be the best flavor profile in general, if and when you can do that. And I know there are a lot of places, either geographic regions or seasonally, you can't get certain, you know, vegetables easily. So, you know, there's a lot of caveats to this, but. And frozen berries, right? I mean, frozen, you can get frozen mango, you can get frozen berries, you know, like, like frozen fruit, I think is even more accessible. Yeah. And on that note, when we freeze things, we do break the cell wall. So in some ways you make it more bioavailable, right? So like there is that, like when you freeze often, if it's got enough um, hydration in the cells, when it's frozen, it will break the cell walls open, which is why you don't want to cook it very long. Um, Or if it's berries, you are already getting more nutrients than you might from even a fresh picked berry. Remember, all the goodies are inside the plant cell walls. So frozen has some benefits. And it is super convenient for people who, you know, who don't have time to cook or don't have, you know, it, it's just super convenient. So, so that's our, that's our, our, our first supplement sort of was talking about juice plus. And there, there was a, there was a case study about somebody who I believe there was a woman who was going through treatment for some sort of cancer and was taking juice plus and, um, their liver enzymes went up. And then when they stopped taking the supplement, the liver enzymes came back down. So, you know, but that's one case study. So, but that's something that is often brought up too, is that, you know, the quality of a product. Um, and as we will discuss later, you know, the, the potential of interactions with treatments as well. So the, the second supplement that I think Again, it's a trend, you know, it comes and goes every few years, the popularity. It's this product called Protandum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, again, is marketed as, you know, kind of one of these like cure-all anti-aging weight loss. Like, I mean, they, they, they all are touted as kind of this, this miracle supplement that you take. And a lot of patients who are getting treatment for cancer will ask about it. Again, I believe it's also a multi-level marketing product, which is, you know, my concern with that is, are these being tested through third-party, you know, assessments? Looking at the bottle, the ingredients are all kind of things that I like. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it has milk thistle, bacopa, and ashwagandha, which are Ayurvedic herbs, green tea and turmeric. Yeah. So commonly used. Yeah. So like depending on what's going on with the patient, any one of those at some time might be like, oh, that's an appropriate thing to take. Then this company took all of these ingredients and then came up with a proprietary blend of these ingredients and are marketing it for, you know, this sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say cure all, but it's, you know, it's, it's supposed to be good for everything, right? Yeah, that is what they market it as. Mm -hmm. And my concern, I have several concerns with a product like that. One being when you look at the label, it says it's a proprietary blend. And I think it's like 675 milligrams of these one, two, three, four, five. (laughs) It's It's a proprietary blend of these five herbs. So, I mean, just looking at turmeric, a typical turmeric capsule is like 500 milligrams. Yeah. And when you're saying turmeric, because that's what they put on the label, you mean the curcumin. Yeah. I mean, well, I don't know how many curcuminoids. I didn't look that up to see what the curcumin portion would be. But I mean, each one of these at least is 250 to 500 milligrams for just a standard dose of just that. I think milk thistle, is that also? Mm -hmm. Generally, we do it in larger doses. Yeah. Yeah. So 
when the total of a capsule is just slightly more than what the dosage of just one of those products would be, I don't know. It just doesn't seem it do, it doesn't add up literally. It doesn't add up. Well, yeah, looking at each of those ingredients, they each have legs, right? They each have a role in both traditional and modern medicine for us, for natural medicine practitioners, putting them all together in low dose and claiming health effects from that. I don't even think that that's probably horrible. I'm not a huge fan of kind of such combinations um because we're just more precise when we do our medicine, but the multi-level marketing piece, I tend to be more critical of MLM products because their founding was to make money, right? So you do an MLM structure because money is your goal. So MLMs tend to have belief built in over science because each person who's selling it, you know, believes in it, yes, but it doesn't need to be backed by science it, because you have sentinels out there, the people who are representing it pushing it with anecdotal stories to their friends and neighbors or whomever online. So I, MLMs in general, I'm, a, I'm leery of. So right there, whether it's Juice Plus, Protandum, or any of the essential oil companies, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean they're bad. It just means I, I'm more skeptical and I look harder at them. And then it costs a lot of money compared to just getting these herbs by themselves, whether it's Juice Plus, and you can buy a lot of fruits and vegetables with what Juice Plus costs month to month, or it's Protandum, and you're looking at just getting the this, this certain curcumin or green tea or bacopa or whatever you're going to take. It's a lot cheaper to buy by itself than pay up the wazoo for, for tandem. And I mean, with bacopa and ashwagandha being Ayurvedic herbs, I mean, those aren't, in according to Ayurveda, they're not for everybody. Right. And so those are two herbs that are very specific for a type of constitution that a person has. And then Milk thistle isn't necessarily something that if somebody's going through treatment for cancer, I would want them to take. Milk thistle can affect how your liver processes things. And well, I mean, as can turmeric, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's always a concern with me is, I mean, so maybe it's not a therapeutic dose of milk thistle, but I still don't know what the quality is or the effect that it's going to have on medications that patients are taking. Yeah, that's a good point because milk thistle can affect how we metabolize those drugs. The other is, you know, protandum by their own claim to fame. When I in Google, just general Google, I put Nerf 2 in. The very mm -hmm. top ad is for protandum Nerf 2, NRF2. Its claim to fame is to increase those very antioxidant enzyme systems within cells that I have been talking about. So let's just say protandum really does what it says it's going to do. And through NRF2, it upregulates all those antioxidant enzyme systems within a cell. Well, don't take it during radiation and don't take it during chemotherapy. That's for sure. I mean, this would be on my do not take list. Yeah. And so their claim is that it's the only supplement shown to reduce oxidative stress by 40% in just 30 days. And so that in itself is a reason not to take it, Yeah, at least during treatment, because that oxidative stress is also known as radiation therapy and chemotherapy. <laughs> and it is not a reason to take it in place of those either. Oh, no, no. Which, I mean, I have had patients who have wanted to do it in place of conventional therapy because that's not how cancer, you know, cancer treatments work. No, no, that's that's not going to work. And, you know, that's this might be an opportunity. So the word antioxidant, it is confusing because when we say antioxidant, we often are talking about a substance. But truth be told, let's just take curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric. Curcumin is an antioxidant at lower doses. But if you give, and you can do this, if you give large doses, let's just say someone takes in eight grams, which is 8,000 milligrams in a day, you begin to get oxidation from that same molecule. So this molecule itself is dose dependent, whether it's an antioxidant or oxidative. That's the same thing with vitamin C. It's an antioxidant at low dose, but if you do it intravenously at large doses, we're talking, you know, 10, 15, 50, 75 grams intravenously, it's now an oxidative action that you're getting from the very same molecule. So just to add a little more confusion to this is antioxidant is is a descriptor. It's an adjective. 
it's more of an adjective than a noun, even though we use it as a noun. We say, you know, we say the antioxidant curcumin. And it's not really true. It's curcumin having an antioxidant action. So that makes it more confusing because we can't really even say in black and white terms whether something is or is not an antioxidant. It's all dose dependent. So I'm just saying that because there's, there is like the research on pancreatic cancer and curcumin, they used giant doses, multiple myeloma, same thing, early stage multiple myeloma, eight grams and above might have some benefit. That's very different. In fact, it is the opposite of taking 500 or 1,000 milligrams of curcumin. So you're getting into like more pharmaceutical dosing and a completely different property. And I mean, we talked about this before we started taping. A lot of the information on turmeric or curcumin, I mean, it, it's it's actually turmeric. A lot of the initial information that came out was based on populations that added it to food. Mm-hmm. And later there were studies that looked at curcumin and those studies, some of those are kind of questionable, you know, so... Reductionism is what we love to do in science and chemistry, and it's a spillover to our medicine, too. We live in a reductionist world. So if turmeric, the root, the spice in whole form is good, then we like to go dig in there and say, well, what chemical compound inside that root is having that benefit? And well, we pulled out curcuminoids, which curcumin is. Curcumin is actually three compounds chemically. In any case, we pulled that out. It only makes up four to six percent of that whole turmeric root. So when we do whole turmeric in a curry or whatever, you're using it, you buy it at the store, you buy the spice as a powder. Curcumin is a very small part of that. But what we've done for our supplements, because this is what we do, we like single compounds. We put in a capsule at 90 or 95 percent of that capsule is now curcumin. So that's very different than turmeric root, which only has four to six percent curcumin, maybe somewhere in that range on average. So I'm saying this because... um, Turmeric and curcumin are often confused with one another, and part of this is the industry's fault because they'll put turmeric on the front of the label, and you turn around, and you look at the contents, and it says 90% curcumin. So it's not really turmeric in the bottle. It's curcumin in the bottle. Which is the isolate. Yeah. So I don't mean to confuse things with more detail, but the fact is it's just not as simple as marketing teams like to let people believe, you know, when they're selling their products out there. Right. And, you know, over the years, I mean, it is, it's these catchphrases, like now by putting plant-based on everything is apparently the catchphrase, right? You know, but yeah, over the years, it's the same products and it's just how the marketing company kind of pitches it to the public. So I guess the, the, this kind of leads us to our next section that we'll we'll take a break and we'll come back and we're going to talk about safety issues, which we've kind of touched on. But yeah, we'll talk about specific safety issues between antioxidant supplements and cancer and cancer treatment. Yeah, it's a really important point because uh, you don't want to undo any of the treatment that you're doing. The reason glutathione support is great for reducing your risk of cancer is because one of its main roles is to protect us from chemicals. This very mechanism may be undesirable if you're receiving chemotherapy or radiation, as the cancer cells can also use glutathione to protect themselves. Okay, so we're back, and we're talking about potential concerns between antioxidants and cancer and cancer treatments. In my mind, I think the first one that I recall hearing about And it may not be the first one, but the big one was lung cancer, lung cancer and high doses of beta carotene supplements. Oh, you mean the higher incidence of lung cancer? Yeah. How it didn't actually protect against cancer in current smokers that it may have actually increased the risk. This was like back in the nineties. Um, and yeah, it may have actually increased the risk of lung cancer in in current smokers. Yeah, those were interesting studies. The headlines in the 90s, and there was a couple out, they were smokers specifically. I remember one was men in Finland. Um, They gave them beta carotene. Another one gave them beta carotene and a type of vitamin E. In any case, the headlines, and this was everywhere in every office and every lay press, I think, too, it increased the cancer rates. So that was the the big splashy headlines at the time. There was no big Google at that time, but to whatever extent. There was Dogpile or yeah. Ask Jeeves. <laughs> Ask Jeeves. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So in any case, what happened after that is they parsed through the data. A few years later, they showed that a couple things they noticed. One, 
when people entered the trial with higher levels of carotenoids in their bloodstream, so before they took the supplement, so those people at baseline who had the highest levels of carotenoids, symbolizing that they ate some you know, yellows and oranges in their diets, right? So they had less lung cancer diagnosis. So when they got it from food, regardless of the supplement. And the other was they found that the increase in lung cancer was only true in certain people with specific breakdown products of the beta carotene due to their genetics in their liver. So your genes program all of your enzymes. Some of these enzymes will then take the beta carotene and metabolize it into procarcinogenic substances because of the smoking on top of it. So the smoking plus this weird metabolism of beta carotene ended up making products that were carcinogenic was the the net outcome. So this was a whole, that particular paper, when I look at Google Scholar, the 1990s papers have thousands and thousands of citations that people have reused that information for their new publications. These updated papers that came out three years later, same group, same authors, very seldom cited because nobody really cares about the actual parsing of the data. What the real problem was they were smoking with this glitch and they took 50,000 IU of beta carotene isolate, which never occurs in nature. We would turn orange before we got that. Well, but th- that's one of the things which we've touched on on, on some of our supplement episodes is, you know, that that trend to take super high doses of a specific vitamin. I mean, that that's a trend that I think is kind of past. There may, there may be some circles where people still do that. And it was something that I did learn in school as well for certain protocols to take super, super high doses that don't appear in nature, um, using it more like a pharmaceutical, um, green pharmacy type of a thing. So yeah, and that's something that I do discourage my patients who are current smokers from taking a high dose multivitamin that has beta carotene in it, even if it's not to that level, encouraging them to try foods instead. Yeah. Yeah. And I know a lot of the most reputable companies went to mixed carotenoids, which means it's not just beta carotene. They used alpha carotene and these other carotenoids in it so that they weren't just giving a single isolate, but they were getting a little bit closer to how nature presents these carotenoids to us, which is we don't do one carotenoid when we eat a carrot or a yellow bell pepper or whatever. (laughs) We get a mixture. The other supplement that I think was a more recent look into, you know, the influence of antioxidants and and lung cancer specifically was um, N-acetylcysteine. And then I believe it was also vitamin E. Yeah. Weren't those shown to increase the risk? My recollection is these were mouse studies, and they showed that there was an increased risk of metastasis, of spread of lung cancer. One, that vitamin E they used was nothing that even occurs in a supplement form, let alone nature. It was this weird thing called Trolox, made by Sigma Aldrich. It's a chemical compound that's not even an antioxidant in the first place. So discard the vitamin E story. The NAC, there is some concern around NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine, because NAC will increase glutathione. And we do have some concerns around increasing glutathione when cancer is present. This is one of those where what we want to do to reduce the risk of a primary diagnosis of cancer may be different than what we do when cancer is present. And NAC is one of those that once cancer has been present in someone, I personally do not recommend NAC to people. That's out of an abundance of caution because we do have animal data showing that taking NAC, increasing glutathione is part of the process. But in animal models, NAC has been shown to possibly increase the spread of existing cancer cells. You know, so in someone who has any diagnosis of cancer in the past, my brain says, well, there could be some cells left. So why do NAC? There's not a time or a place that I can think of that NAC has to be done. I think that something that's going to confuse our listeners is, you know, one minute we're like, well, those studies were done in mice, you know, those were mice studies. And then another time we're like supporting the data where we were like, well, those were found in animal studies. And so that's one thing that can be really confusing is we do dismiss certain data because of the fact that this was 
this was a mouse study. And then other times we are, you know, using a mouse study to back up why we might not use something as well. So I'm sure people are getting confused out there like, wait a minute, but that was just a mouse study. But because we do tend to be overly cautious that if something has been shown to be detrimental in a mouse study, in my mind, it has more weight than something that shows to be beneficial in a mouse study. Exactly. Yes. You can't really prove benefit from a mouse study, but if there is proof of harm, possible harm, I weigh that more heavily because you can't take something that's possibly harmful and do an ethical study in humans with that substance. So if we gave people with lung cancer or any other cancer NAC, and then we said, oh, look at that, the people who took it did have faster spread. That's not an ethical clinical trial. So we will never have the human data, thankfully. And some people question as to whether testing on mice is ethical too, but we won't go well, there. Well, sure. I just went there. Yeah. <laughs> I just went there and I'm backing up. Um, so, I totally um, agree with that. Yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> so the other, the other big, you know, antioxidant cancer interactions that you hear about would be with prostate cancer and vitamin E because there was the SELECT trial where they looked at selenium and vitamin E and you know, let's, let's speak about that with, with taking those as supplements, as opposed to getting those nutrients from food. Yeah. My hedge for that information, um, taking vitamin E and selenium is not something I would recommend to men who have had prostate cancer. I would say, get it from your diet, you know, eat nuts, eat whole foods. Um, we don't want a deficiency in them, but I would not have people take those nutrients in a pill form. Well, I know with the SELECT trial, they looked at whether selenium and or vitamin E was a way to prevent prostate cancer. And what they found was that the vitamin E supplements, whatever it was, whatever form that people were taking, most likely an alpha tocopherol, because that's what's most commonly found over the counter, it actually increased the occurrence of prostate cancer. So- Again, this is where, you know, selenium, you know, it's found in Brazil nuts, Brazil nuts that are grown in soil that contains selenium. Um, Mm -hmm. That's a really important thing to point out is that just because it's a Brazil nut doesn't necessarily mean it's rich in selenium. It's based on the soil. Good point. Mm -hmm. And are Brazil nuts, are those a tree? I don't even know how those are grown. It's a tree? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's a very large tree. Well, in the vitamin E story with prostate cancer in the SELECT trial is another example of an isolate, a single form isolate of a nutrient, vitamin E in this case, that is given in a higher dose than you would get it and in a form you wouldn't get it because vitamin E in nature occurs with other vitamin E compounds. Vitamin E, backing up, is not one molecule. (laughs) Vitamin E is a term that refers to eight different vitamin E's that occur in nature. So we say vitamin E because it's convenient. But when we say vitamin E, it could be any one, or if we're talking about a food, it's several different ones of these tocopherols or tocotrienols that occur. So there's four tocopherols, four tocotrienols that occur in nature. Those eight forms are, again, you know, I love the word. Vitamers. (laughs) I'm learning. I'm learning Uh vitamers. Brought to you by vitamers. Yeah. So, you know, the story is more complicated. Of course, but I think the take home point that we keep getting back to is doing an isolated compound, whatever it is, a single compound in a pill form at a higher dose than you would get in food. That is the experiment that goes awry. And most of these studies that blame the antioxidant in air quotes, at that point, maybe it's not acting as an antioxidant. Maybe we're pushing it to the level where we're oxidating people. I don't know. And speaking of pushing things towards the oxidative level, we've already touched on the concern with interactions with cancer treatments, which tend to be pro-oxidant. So I don't know if we really need to go much into that because we have talked about that already. So concerns of taking any sort of an antioxidant pill while receiving many types of conventional cancer treatments. Yeah. I usually just hold them. Yeah. And part of me thinks like, oh, well, chemotherapy, it's, you know, is taking this antioxidant pill, like throwing a pebble at a giant. I don't want to know. Let's just hold it. Is there a food that is a substitute? Like, let's include more of this food in your diet, whereas nutrition is so important when you're going through treatment. You know, like, it's just, 
you can hold if if you're really devoted to your multivitamin, let's just hold it mm-hmm. for however many weeks. Or if somebody is on a long term treatment, let's let's try to find other options that perhaps are providing more more of a whole food experience, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this goes under the one in doubt, leave it out. Um, One of the things I really think people should never do is do a concentrated amount of polyphenols during radiation in particular. So you're talking food, even food? Yeah, if they have like a Vitamixer or a juicer and they think, you know, doing whatever their kale beet juice or kale carrot or whatever their thing is that they might be juicing up for health maintenance or to feel good, you might feel better, but are you increasing some of those intracellular antioxidant enzymes, which those juices do, don't get me wrong. I mean, in the grand scheme, I would rather people not do that. I don't think of vitamin C as powerful as that shake is. So not doing a blueberry, kale, acai berry, is that how you say it? Acai? Acai berry um, smoothie during radiation? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But what about having a handful of blueberries on your Greek yogurt? Me personally, um, I discourage people during radiation to do a lot of that stuff. I know you need some. I think a handful of blueberries, fine, on your food. But you can eat well enough to get your nutrients, but you kind of want to be at a minimalist level of nutrients. So, you know, that whole teeter-totter I mentioned earlier between antioxidant and oxidants, you know, during radiation, you want the teeter-totter to be more oxidative. It doesn't feel good. You'll be fatigued. I don't have any way of correcting that without pushing antioxidants though. So I feel like in some ways it's kind of like going through the fire to get to the other side. So you, you have to know that you're not going to feel well and maybe make sure you take the time off to take care of yourself as if you were, you know, sick. You know, you take time off and you allow this the process to happen. I tell people they can eat normally, but don't push the high color. And, and, you know, with something like radiation, it's not like, you know, there are, you know, we've had patients, many patients who have, you know, they are on chemotherapy for life. Radiation is limited. Right. Yeah. Very different. That's why I say radiation specifically, because it's always oxidative. It's always the mechanism of radiation. Chemotherapy may or may not be working through an oxidative mechanism. And chemotherapy waxes and wanes. In other words, it's only therapeutic while it's in its therapeutic range. And then you can eat all the colorful fruits and vegetables you want when the chemo is not being active. When Because chemo is usually finite. It could be a couple hours or 10 days, but there's a finite amount of time where the chemo is having an action and then it's not. And then some chemos aren't even all that oxidative. I mean, that's not their mechanism of action. Right. We're just making this more complex because we're like food, food, food. And then we're like, except for when you have food. (laughs) I know. Well, and I'm probably more cautious than a lot of naturopaths because um, I'm of an age where with age comes a growing respect for the unknown. And I'm well aware of what we know and we don't know. Um, And so I'm very cautious, you know, I'm more cautious now than I was 25 years ago, for sure. And that just means never getting in the way of the actual treatment, especially if it's curative, right? If we're talking about a treatment that's curative, then you want zero risk of getting in front of that treatment and undoing any of its effect. Okay. Do we have anything else that we want to cover before we come in for our landing, before we fasten our seatbelts. I think I've and- thoroughly confused people at this point, so I think I'll stop here. <laughs> I know. People are like, wait, what was the point of this episode? Because I, yeah, right. I, where they were looking for answers and surprise, there are no answers. They're inconveniently complicated answers. Yeah. Okay. So let's wrap it up. So we don't get that much fan mail, but we do get these really awesome reviews from y'all. And so I wanted just to read some of them because they're super, super nice. I don't know who all the people are because they have their own little, little names. They don't necessarily put their actual name on there, but yeah. So I'll just cut to the point. Let's go back to our first review. It's so nice. It's back from October, 2021. And it reads... Tina and Leia bring clarity to issues that not only people with cancer can benefit from. 
This is a podcast everyone could learn from before faced with something as intense as cancer. They are funny and down to earth and are excellent teachers. They articulate the complex biochemical reactions that occur from cancer treatments and other things we consume daily. Listen and enjoy. Now, that's a really funny that I chose that one to read because I feel like <laughs> after this episode, people will be like, what? I don't think so. So <laughs> let's see. Is there one that you like in particular? You know, if I was as prepared as I should be, they'd be in front of me, but I don't have them up in front of me. Okay. So I'll pick another one. Let's see. Oh, this is the most recent one. And I know who this is from, but I'm not going to call them out. But I tottotally know who wrote this one. Um, a very avid listener. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't me. Um, okay. So it reads, an amazing resource. I can't believe I get to listen to this without paying a copay. Tina and Leah are so smart, funny, and have a perspective that's sorely missing in most, most healthcare providers. As a cancer person, it's the first podcast I recommend to new cancer friends. And I have to say that as a cancer person, I recommend their podcast too. Stephanie from Cancer for Breakfast. You said you were so, going to call her out. You just I did. know, but I, I just that was just like the most awesome review. And I, I recognized a name. Um, I called her out. Maybe we'll edit it out. No, no, I no, no. We keep give it. her props because they've given us yeah. props on their show. And for sure. um, yeah, Cancer for Breakfast is definitely my go-to. So, so those are a couple of the reviews. If you want your review read on the air, leave us one. Gosh darn it. Yep. Yeah, we start reading. Let's start reading those at the end or at the beginning. Doesn't matter. But we'll read them sometime. We're going to read maybe in the middle. In the middle. Maybe we'll read them during our segues. We'll surprise you. Oh, and speaking of surprise, I don't know if anyone has ever stuck around to the very end of our music at the after our episodes, but sometimes there are little Easter eggs so go back and listen to some episodes. I don't remember which ones we have our Easter eggs on, but we started doing that and I think they're funny. We do it mostly for ourselves because we think it's funny. So Yeah, because we're so loopy. But by the end, we're so completely loopy after the end of editing that we're like, oh, this has to go somewhere in there. Um, yeah. So yeah, look out for our Easter eggs and leave us comments on those. Rate us, give a... Share an episode with a friend if you think that they might find it beneficial. Share us on social media. We are on all the major social media accounts. I don't even know if they're major anymore. But just look for The Cancer Pod. That's who we are on most of the platforms. Mm -hmm. I'm saying most because we're not on some platforms. Well, we can do so much. That's right. I can barely do what, what we're doing. Our main platform is Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. And every once in a while, I'll clean out my mailbox and just throw up studies that I want to read later on Twitter. So if I throw up a study, it doesn't necessarily mean that I've read it. It's just more like, oh, that's really interesting. I'm going to file that somewhere. I'm going to file it on Twitter and maybe someone else will read it too. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ever want to see what's in my mailbox, just go to Twitter, my email box. Anything else, Tina? All right. No, I honestly think that... An honest review of antioxidants may not clarify anything for people. So let me just apologize about that. And uh, the truth is messy when it comes to antioxidants. That's all there is to it. There's no way to make it super simple without fibbing. Yeah. And a, a lot of it is because, yeah, there is a great unknown still. Yes. So if you stick to only what is known instead of what you wish was true, it is still a question <laughs> in a lot of ways. <laughs> So on that note, I'm Dr. Leah Sherman. And I'm Dr. Tina Kayser. And this is The Cancer Pod. Until next time. Thanks for listening to The Cancer Pod. Remember to subscribe, review, and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media for updates. And as always, this is not medical advice. These are our opinions. Talk to your doctor before changing anything related to your treatment plan. The Cancer Pod is hosted by me, Dr. Leah Sherman, and by Dr. Tina Kayser. Music is by Kevin McLeod. See you next time. Okay, so we're back, and we're talking about issues, issues, 
issues. Bless you. <laughs>